<laughs> not right yet. So, so he's the man. So, pa oh. Pastor Darren, you want to say anything? Hmm? Say that again. No, I look. I was trying to talk to Daryl. Hey, so yeah, I, I'm recording right now. Um, worst case scenario, uh, when everything comes back up, uh, I will just take the recording, edit it, and put it on uh, Facebook and YouTube. All right. But I know it's already five o'clock, so you know yes. we, we can do what we need to do. Yeah. So we're gonna go ahead. I see folk are coming on. Let me check it out. You're gonna have me as one of the hosts right now. Okay. Let's see what's going yeah, on. Yeah, you're already a host now. Okay, awesome, awesome. All right. Well, Pastor, we're going to go ahead and, um, Pastor Darren, if you want to kick us off, um, and then we're just going to jump right on in, and uh, we're just going to pray that the Lord restores your power so we can connect the Facebook as well. Uh, but we're thankful for those who are on right now. Yeah, we and we have an elderly in our neighborhood as well, you know, who, who who needs that stuff, man. So yeah, we just want to pray for our whole neighborhood. Uh, but yeah, let's 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 go ahead and start. Father, in the name of Jesus, um, we come before you now, thanking you for another Sabbath day, thanking you for life, a reasonable portion of health and strength. I'm asking, Father God, that you be with us um, as we discuss this pandemic that that, that did not catch you by surprise. Uh, you knew when it was going to come, how long it was going to be here. Um, and, and, and I'm just asking, since you know, beginning from the end, help us not to worry because we know who the author and finisher is. We know who the one who holds this whole world in his hands is. And, and that is you, our Lord and Savior. Uh, thank you so much, Lord God, uh, that you gave us tools to use um, to, to, to maintain good health. And we have an expert uh, that will show us how to properly use those tools in Dr. Brown. So God, the discussion, uh, and we'll trust that you can work out all the tech challenges as well. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you to this evening's program entitled COVID-19 and Black Education. And we're just absolutely excited. We welcome the Longview Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church. My friend, uh, Pastor Alex Horton is on with us. He's one of our hosts for this evening's program. And, um, and, and Pastor Horton, it's just good to have you, man. And, uh, and your yeah. lovely wife, Deborah, it's good to see you all. Uh, I, I consider him truly a friend. I followed him at the Ephesus Church and he now pastors the Longview Heights Church in Memphis, Tennessee. And, and we just have a lot of crazy connections that way because he's following my brother-in-law yeah. in that church as well. So yeah. we're just connected. I pastored uh, his daughter and, and, and uh, dedicated uh, grandson uh, to the Lord. So I, I'm thankful that God has blessed us to share this journey together. He's a tremendous proclaimer of the word of God and, and, and a social activist, a leader in the community. And pastor, we're just delighted to have you this evening and we're going to be working this thing together and then we also have with us i'm going to mention as well for those who are joining us for the first time pastor daryl uh, palmes who is the assistant pastor of the decatur seventh adventist church he he is uh the technical host for this program tonight but we did have some strong winds coming through the atlanta uh, metro area just about an hour ago I experienced those, but fortunately our power is still on, but uh, Daryl's power is out. So he's managing this um, with very limited resources. So we're gonna pray that the Lord will bless you so that you can be up and running and we can connect to Facebook as well. Uh, in the meantime, we certainly wanna welcome those of you who are here on Zoom with us. We also have uh, today, um, one who uh, may be new to a lot of you, maybe uh, a lot of you may know him, but he comes to us in the person of Dr. Milton L. Brown. And it's just a real joy to have him on. I, I, I tell you, it's a joy, it's a blessing. Uh, let, let me say this. Um, so Dr. Brown comes to us and he is a double doctorate. Uh, he has a, uh, he's a graduate of, of Oakwood College, now university. He went there from 83 to 87, where he did his um, BS in biology, and then went on to uh, Harvard University, where he completed his, 
his master's in 1985, and then in 95 on to the University of Alabama in Birmingham, where he completed a PhD in organic chemistry. And then in 1999, he completed his medical degree from the University of Virginia. I want to tell you today that we're very proud um, of, of, of his accomplishments. He is a scientist. He is an inventor. Uh, he's been uh, associate professor uh, with tenure in neuroscience at Georgetown Medical University. Um, also director of, of the drug discovery program while there as well. And a uh, full professor with tenure in pharmacology, physiology, also Georgetown University Medical Center. A uh, full professor with tenure in biochemistry. I, I do have a question I want to ask you though, Doc. You have an MD in translational medicine. I mean, that's just some heavy stuff. Can you break that down for us? What, what is translational medicine? <laughs> uh, well, sir, it's, uh, it's the process by which we make new therapies. You know, most physicians, almost all physicians prescribe medicine, but they don't make the medicine. And where the medicine comes from, that type of program uh, is either a pharmaceutical company or a translational medicine uh, laboratory or, 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 or group. And so uh, some years ago, I, I was a, a leader in implanting those kinds of groups onto medical school campuses. Wow. Man, that's absolutely awesome. And, and, and I also realized you are the first black PhD in chemistry from UAB, is, is that correct? First black PhD in organic chemistry um, from the from University of Alabama, Birmingham, yeah. All right. we, we absolutely praise God for that. I wanna tell you all that the awards and um, patents that he holds uh, for drugs as an inventor, um, it's just too numerous to, to list in this program. But I'm gonna say this for Dr. Milton Brown. Uh, when we first met, and this was a few years ago, uh, I don't know, it was four or five years ago uh, that you came to Ephesus while I was there to speak for your alma, alma mater where you graduated, Ephesus Academy. And, um, and the interesting thing about it is you all, that he came to speak there and on that very same day, I remember this, you were receiving a national award from National Academy of Science that same day, but you chose to still come and speak <laughs> rather than get that, go to that award. And that, that just said something to me and about your humility and what an inspiration you were to, to the entire church, to the community and to myself um, when you spoke that day. And so I've never forgotten that. And so we're just glad to have you back here with us today. And we know that God is going to uh, you is using you and, and, and we're going to be blessed today um, with what we're going to experience. So I'm going to jump right on in um, again. Thank you for being with us, uh, Milt and um, and Pastor Alex as well. Appreciate you so much. So why don't we just jump on in and Pastor Alex, we're going to allow you if you take it away and, and lead us with the questions that we have for Dr. Brown today. OK, this is the first question that we have is. Let's begin at the beginning. What are coronaviruses? Where do they originate? How long have they been around? Well, sir, that's a good question. Uh, they've been around for as long as God created them because he created everything. And uh, they resided in animals. Uh, typically, these types of Viruses reside in, in animals, camels and, and bats and, and cats. And uh, this virus that, that, we, we, that we are dealing with now, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, was a virus that wasn't meant to act this way. It wasn't meant to, to uh, jump from animals into humans and to be able to be transmitted from humans to humans. And now we're seeing it even transmitted now from humans back to dogs and back to other animals. So it, it's, uh, it's a virus that wasn't, wasn't uh, created to, to, 
to be this way. It's misbehaving and uh, it's causing havoc um, in, our, in our world. Dog, a quick uh, question for you. Let me write yes. there, because you said this twice, and I, I, I'm trying to listen very closely to every word you say. So <laughs> when you say it, <laughs> it wasn't meant to act this way, it wasn't meant to behave this way, can you extrapolate on that some more? Um, was this thing, was this virus um, naturally originating, or was it engineered, human engineered? And, and, and how, what does it have to do with not meant to act this way? Well, the, the virus itself was is a coronavirus that we'd never seen infect humans. It was it's a virus that has been in animals. We've seen coronaviruses before. The the uh, SARS CoV back in two thousand three. We've had um, MERS virus in two thousand nine was a coronavirus, and we now have the two thousand nineteen second version of, of uh, 2003 version of, of coronavirus. The, the, it, being a believer and a Christian, um, and, and because the word of God said that he created everything visible and invisible, I leave those types of quotes to our, our, you know, our theologians, but he, he said invisible and visible. Mm -hmm. And that and, and viruses are definitely fall within the invisible category, and God created them. Now, how this virus became uh, disobedient or, or or not acting in the way it was created, we 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 don't know whether it was engineered or whether it just jumped from animals into a human by a bite or some type of infection, and then or maybe someone ate it. But nonetheless, um, we have this virus. We're dealing with this virus. And uh, we, we have to protect ourselves from, from this virus that, that is now in our community. OK. OK. So, so it's not quite clear yet what I'm also hearing you saying as to where it originated from, where there was, say, in the, in the meat market in Wuhan, or in a science lab, is the jury still well, out on we that? know it came from yeah, we know it came from Wuhan, China. Uh, we we don't know if it was manipulated. Um, we we don't know if scientists there. Um, they do have one of the world's largest uh, uh, virology centers in the world in Wuhan. It's just coincidental that it's there. Um, did it come from them manipulating it, or did it come naturally from out of the the uh, the, the the out of nature? Um, uh, we we don't have information uh, at the moment on on that, and and not to speculate, uh, we'll just say we know it came from Wuhan. We know God didn't create it to be this way, and He didn't create this virus to act this way but this virus has now become disobedient. Like any other cell in your body, if your eyelids of laying a hand and your pancreas become disobedient and you, you lose the secretion of insulin, you get diabetes. You know, if your cardiac, cardiomyocyte or cardi cardiac cell decides to not beat rhythmically like the rest of the cells, you will get an arrhythmia. If a neuron begins to not act the way it was created and begins to rapidly fire repeatedly over and over again, you get epilepsy. So uh, this is not it's unusual, but when things aren't are acting in the way that it was originally created, then we get these problems and we get these either disease or or aberrant types of of, of infections and things that we see in, in nature. So we know this is a virus. Can you kind of help us out with that? Is uh, what does a virus do to us? Okay, so this virus, this virus is a really has a real interesting way, and I'll, I'll tell you the story, and and try to make it. And if I if I say something that um, is too high level, just stop me, and I'll try to do a better job at explaining it. But this virus, this virus attacks uh, your cells either by breathing it in 
And I want you to understand this, or you can ingest it. So you can breathe it through your nostrils or you can eat it. And either way gives you an infection. So the, infect, the, the virus comes in and uh, if you were to ball your hand up like a fist, that would be the cell. And then the virus has a spike protein that it sticks right into the, into the, 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 into the cell. And because it sticks it into the cell, into this receptor, it pulls it right into side of the, inside of the cell. Now, why is that important? Well, once it gets inside of the cell, uh, the, the COVID-19 locks the door. It doesn't allow any other virus to get in. It closes the, 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 the way uh, viruses try to get in. It locks the door. Then it begins, the first thing it does, it turn, it replicates itself. It makes many, many copies of itself inside of the cell. And once it makes many, many copies inside of the cell, it sees the goodies, it sees the valuables in the cell, and it goes around the cell and harvests the good, the, 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 the good valuables of the cell. Then the virus goes to the nucleus of the cell and it does something very interesting. It turns off the sprinkler system. So the cell has been made, wonderfully made with a, a system that will put out fires and that fire is, is inflammation. But, so the, 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 the cell has been made to have natural mechanisms to put out the fire. What do you think that the virus does uh, once it puts out the virus, I mean, puts out the once it puts out the uh, the sprinkler system, it turns and makes a fire, a big one. Starts this process, and it looks and it sees some uh, some gasoline, and it sees a, a thing of gasoline that throws it down, and it it accelerates another fire hmm. that we call a cytokine storm which is a type of infection and inflammation that attacks the surrounding cells and organs and tissues. And you go from a local infection or local inflammation to a multi-organ, multi-system disease. Hmm. And this, this, this virus uh, is, 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 is very, it is, the virus itself is not causing, really causing the havoc. It's the fire that it starts, and because it turned off the sprinkler system in the cell, the, the, the cell can't put the fire out. Hmm. And so because it can't put the fire out, then the, the, and it, it, the, the virus sees the opportunity. It throws down more accelerant, like a gas, and makes the fire really hot. And now it's out of control and it begins to spread to other cells, other tissues, other organs, and we get a terrible, terrible uh, outcome uh, from this virus. Wow. You know, what we thought was a respiratory virus, because it was called the novel, and I want everybody to continue to use that word. We've kind of dropped that word, novel coronavirus or novel COVID-19. We just now say COVID-19. We just now say coronavirus. But the novel gives you a picture of what it means that we have never seen this virus in our society or have dealt with this virus before. This particular virus. This virus starts in the lungs. If you inhale it, it goes through the, what I just told you, how it infects the cell. And when it comes out and begins to be accelerant, the, the body can't fight this virus. In fact, people want to use antioxidants, vitamin C, and many of the home remedies that we, we like to use, elderberry. But how can those things work when the sprinkler system for the cell is turned off? Hmm. See, those right. types of good uh, home remedies that we use work for a cell that has the capability of responding. But it's it's been inactivated. It's it's been it's been the the system that is that was made 
for it to respond to, to foreign invaders have been turned off. Wow. And so this, this, is, this, becomes, this becomes a very, very bad problem. And uh, what happens in the lungs, you see a pneumonia. The patients come into the emergency room with fever, cough, headache. Then they have a shortness of breath, which when you image it, you see a vast pneumonia, which can progress into what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, which about 60% of patients don't survive that. Wow. And, 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 and it has very high mortality. So what they thought was a severe, uh, severe respiratory disease, uh, we quickly began to understand it was more than a respiratory disease, uh, Dr. Compton. It was, it was more than that. It, we began to see people coming in the emergency room. China told us that they were seeing, they had a study that was reported way back early March that said, hey, 187 people came in, 28% of those patients had a cardiac problem. Hmm. They, they had arrhythmias and left ventricular dysfunction. Now we begin to see patients that were being put on the ventilator in the ICU, 80% of those patients were on, vent, on, on uh, dialysis. Not hmm. just the ventilator, but they were on dialysis for for their kidneys, their kidneys begin to be, be dysfunctional. And, and what that told you is the virus was attacking the lungs, then that accelerant was put on it and it turned into the cytokine storm and it attacked the heart, the kidneys, the liver. 20% of patients that come into the IC, into the, to the emergency department have are having seizures from this virus. Young Man, people. Let me ask you something. Have you, have we seen anything like this before? Is this, like you said, is the, is the Nova um, coronavirus, right? It's new. We haven't seen this before, this particular strain. But is this um, unique in terms of all that it does? I mean, all these multi-organs, multi-organ attack. Dr. Khan, Dr. Khan, this, this is, this is, this is novel. No. You, that this this you know I I want I want people to understand we we haven't really seen a virus I mean I haven't even finished the types of, to tell you that you know this causes stroke in young people hmm. you were seeing young people just all of a sudden have strokes when what surprised us about a month ago was the report that COVID nineteen is also found in live in in sperm. And so you can breathe in this virus and transmit it sexually. I mean, this is a, this is this is a different kind of virus that we're dealing with. And in fact, patients who get the diarrhea, the nausea, diarrhea, along with the shortness of breath, so they got the GI or the gut infected, and they also have it in their lungs. Those patients have a really poor prognosis of of, of survival. So the, these symptoms are, are, are really, um, really important to understand because this is more than just a severe respiratory virus. Someone, uh, Margo asked this question, why do some people with the virus have no symptoms and never get sick if the operation of the virus is to turn off the sprinkler system? Does it not do that? in some people? It does it in all people. But for some people, they're able to overcome either turning their sprinkler system back on uh, or they're able to signal the cavalry to come and attack these cells that have been infected. Um, not everyone, this is not an all or none. Like everyone gets this, but not all the people get the cytokine storm. We don't know why people don't get some certain people don't get the cytokine storm and they progress to multi organ, multi disease. Uh, we do know that African Americans have a propensity five times more to be hospitalized 
and die from this virus. And we have a reason because one of these proteins that's involved in this process of processing the virus, we have, and I'm gonna use a big word, here it comes, a big word, really, really big word, is the polymorphism. And, uh, you know, I, my, for my scholars, that means it's, a, uh, it's an enzyme that has a polymorphism, means it's an enzyme that has variants. Um, like if you were to go to ice cream store and, uh, and, and, and see 31 flavors, all of my ice cream, all of them are ice cream, but one is, they're different. African-Americans, Italians, Native Americans, Latinos have a polymorphism and an enzyme that processes this virus, clips a piece off, takes it outside of the cell and places it on a flagpole so that the Calvary, the immune system, the immune cells of the body can see it and says, oh, that's not normal. That's a foreign invader. We need to attack that cell. But when you have a polymorphism there, you're slowly to react. You can't place the peptide outside of the cell as readily as others that don't have this polymorphism. And so you may have a slower response to this virus which causes you then to allow more of this fulminant cytokine storm. That, that issue is related to our health disparity. And uh, I could go into much more detail about that. But, but that, that gives us an understanding of why our community is more susceptible to this virus. Our children are more susceptible to this virus because of these issues. And uh, one of the points that you brought up in that question, uh, it was that Margot asked a question, very good question. Many people can be asymptomatic. That means big word for, they don't have headache, fever, runny nose, diarrhea, nausea. They don't have the symptoms of the virus, but they are highly infectious. And children represent a, a good proportion of those types of individuals where they will have the infected virus inside of them, but they and they'll be a, and they're shedding the virus to give it to others, but they don't have the symptoms. Right. And in fact, for adults, many people, two to three, four days when you were exposed to the virus and got infected. It might take two, three, four, or five days for you to begin to show symptoms. But that whole period of time, you were infective, infectious, and you were passing the virus to others. I see. That's Mar scary. Yeah. So we have some other, we have another, and since you're talking about children, we have one of our principals uh, for one of our schools. Um, is asking if air purifiers can help with our schools. What ways can we keep our kids safe for small schools who have less than 90 kids? All right, I, wa I want to say one thing. Uh, Dr. Compton, I want to say one thing. I want people to write this down because what I'm about to tell you is going to be life-saving. I want people to write this down. What I'm about to tell you is going to be life-saving. There are three things that can stop this virus. The first thing, 60 to 70% of the population has to be infected so that the number of vectors or people who represent infection, if you begin to get a, below above that, you will start to see the virus infections go down. We call that the herd effect. Herd. Now, we only have a, right now about 5 million people positive with COVID. And given that we don't have a national testing plan and we don't have a standardized testing uh, pathway for all of the states, that means one state is doing one thing, one other state is doing another thing. 
we're, we're probably missing some estimate that we have 10 times that much infections in the community. So that means instead of us, we've only detected 5 million, but let's say we have 50 million people infected already. We still got to get to 60 to 70% of 330 million. So that's about 250 million people before this will kick in. We got a long ways to go before we get to that point. So the second, the first thing is the herd effect. We got to get at least 250, 260 million people infected before we even begin to see it. The second thing that will help us with the herd effect immunity, and, 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 and this is, this is um, I'll, I'll say something about the herd effect. When, when I was a kid back in the day, when a person, a kid had little sores on them and people recognized that they had the chicken pox, they would put us all in the same room together. So we all get the chicken pox, all the kids in the neighborhood. The chicken pox would no longer be effective in our neighborhood once we all got it. And that was the old way of doing the herd effect. But in this case, with this virus, which has a 5% and mo and we, we're, we're, ca we're seeing 5% uh, mortality, that means death rate. If, and and, and it, you, you can't afford to do that with this virus, just give people the infection and then allow them to recover because they, we will have a humongous, you know, we, that would be, you know, close to 17, 18 million people dead, which yeah. would be devastating. So we can't do it the way we do chicken pox. So the herd effect is one way that will, I want you to write that down, that will infect well, that will stop this virus. Number two, now, before a, you go on, a vaccine. Before you, before you go on, Don, before you go on. Yeah. So, um, because you, you, you said the herd effect is, it seems like if I'm hearing you right, that the herd effect is necessary. But then you're also saying, which I'm thinking that if we go with that, it would be a, a catastrophic problem given the nature of this virus. Yes. You know, uh, for 260 million people, I mean, you know, or 200 million people. Or well, we have 300, that. we have 330 million people in the United States. Yeah. So 5% would be, you know, 17, 18 million people. Yeah. That's a lot. We, we can't, we can't do that. That's right. So yeah. we have to, another way to get people immunity, a herd effect is to give them a vaccine. That's the number two. Okay. So if you if we get a vaccine, that will stop the virus because now we'll build herd immunity because people will be protected by the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But we have no vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I could talk to you more about when we think we'll get the vaccine, which probably uh, at the at the earliest next summer. At the early next summer. So yeah. you wouldn't take the first vaccine that they bring out at the end of the year. I don't think they're going to bring a vaccine out at the end of the year. Well, whatever first one that they bring out, do you think you would take it? I, I'm I'm going to take the vaccine. Uh, you 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 got you got a better shot if that vaccine gives you uh, gives you antibody development towards the COVID nineteen than you do without it. Okay. All right. Okay. There's no conspiracy theorists here. We, we got to get a vaccine right. to save our lives. But we don't have it, and there's some reasons why we don't have it. We've been working on coronavirus vaccines since 2003, 17 years. You think we're going to just get it because we said we're going to put a billion dollars towards it? Come on. There are some real reasons, and it has to do with that spike protein and the ability to, to cause the body to react to that spike protein when the virus, now watch this, the virus can change that spike protein into another form. In fact, if you make a vaccine for one spike protein, it's like a key. You know, when you go to put a key in your lock, you only got one key, you give a copy of it, but there's only one key that fits it. Because if not, somebody else will put a key in there and open your door. But the spike protein is like the key your body is like the lock. The spike protein can make five or six different keys 
and 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 open the same lock. So you're making a a vaccine to one key, and it changes and brings you another key. So there may be some there may be some real reasons why we are going to struggle with this vaccine. But nonetheless, we God is able and if he decides to allow us to have this vaccine, we'll get one and we'll have one, uh, I mean, earliest possible is probably um, summer. Wow. Because and that's early. even with what we're hearing, you know, from the NIH and even Fauci talk, and, and he's very, he hedges it quite a bit, you know. We got something from Moderna and I know AstraZeneca and others are working on that. But even with all of that, you're saying with all the testing and everything, the trials and all of that stuff, all the clinical trials, not till next summer. Well, we just started, we haven't initiated phase three studies. They're starting hopefully in the next couple of weeks. The Moderna um, vaccine that you're talking about, it's a vaccine towards mRNA for, for, the, for the COVID-19. But, but Dr. Fauci, who is really a truly a hero, um, even he says, you know, we're not going to best, best efforts get it before March. Because, even, because we, the, this phase three has, they're, they're, looking to, they're looking to test it against 30,000 people. Mm. So they got to get 30,000 people to register. <laughs> then they got to follow them to see if they get infected if they if they uh respond with the appropriate antibodies at the level that would be protective and once you analyze all of that you got to decide whether it was effective in that group and then we have to produce 100 and 200 million vials <laughs> by march not happening but we're going to get a vaccine. We'll get a vaccine, hopefully. I Are think you working on anything, a, Doc? Are you huh? working on something? Yeah, we're working on some things to make the body respond, turn the, um, turn the sprinkler system back on. Mm -hmm. And so that comes to the number three. Mm -hmm. So we said herd immunity, vaccine, and number three is a drug therapy hmm. that will protect you and make the virus more like the flu, where you would get eight to 10 days of, you know, feeling like the cruds, but you won't get the multi-organ, lung, heart, kidney, gastrointestinal, brain disease that we're seeing with COVID-19. Hmm. It kind of makes it not have the big bite that it has and it, it keeps it under bay. So those are the three things. Let me say this clearly to, our, to your listening audience, to the people of God, to the community. Unless one of those three things happen, we have done nothing to this virus. Hmm. This virus right now is the same bad dog that it was in February. It is today. And it will not change unless one of those three things come into effect. That's why I said write it down, because then you'll know when to come out, because you will, you one of those three things has happened. Now, in the meantime, to limit the spread of the virus, we do social distancing, we wear masks, we wash our hands, and we stay vigilant. But that has no effect on the effectiveness of this virus. Mm -hmm. The virus is still here mm -hmm. in full effect, 100% as it was back in when we first saw it in, in January, February. Nothing has changed about it. So that's why I want to talk about to the young, to the, to the people who are interested uh, about, you know, the school issues. You know, Georgia is on fire. Yeah. Uh, we're talking to two different groups here today. Those in Memphis, Tennessee, the great city of Memphis, those in Atlanta, great city of Atlanta. Uh, but I want to tell you right now, those living in Georgia, you on fire. Mm -hmm. you, you got historic numbers, 107 deaths last night. Wow. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, 
You know, 4,800 new cases in Georgia on Friday alone. Yeah. You're on yeah. fire. Yeah. So you have to be very diligent. And I, I, I want to talk about something because I think this is irrelevant to our schools, I mean, to our, 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 our parents right now trying to make decisions. Yeah. And Pastor, if you give me a few minutes, I'm, I, I got to tell a story. I got to give them a, a visual you know, you when you preach, right? You 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 make the word of God come to life. Yes, sir. Right? You 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 give the people a visual about what they're experiencing now and what they will experience in the future. And 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 when they can tie that together, they they see they see the glory of God because they they can they can they can visualize it. Yeah. I gotta let some people visualize some things right now. I'm not gonna do it as good as as you, but but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, uh, to tell, you know, the first question I'm going to ask, what will stop your kids from getting COVID-19 at school? Hmm. We just talked about the three things that stopped the virus. Number one, we said the herd effect. Number two, we said a vaccine. Number three, we said a drug therapy that stops the virus. Nothing. Nothing will stop we have nothing to stop this this virus right now. So so when people are talking about I don't have a small school, I got 90 students, there is nothing that you can do to stop this virus from infecting your school and infecting people on, without just social distancing. That's all we have. Mm -hmm. So the virus is still at the door looking to get in to bite you. And, and so I, I come up to this point. What will stop your kids from bringing it home? Nothing. Nothing. So here, let, let's get a visual about this. See, because I think I think we're rushing into something that we don't really have a visual. When when we were talking about the schools and 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 socialization, don't get bamboozled. People talking about kids if they don't have socialization, if they take off time from school now, they're going to be uh, 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 they're, they're not going to be mature. They're going to be they're they're going to be devastated. That's that's those are not true. We, we've been homeschooling kids for fifty years, hundred years. Homeschooling kids. Those kids don't sit in a regular classroom. They're home. They get a micro taught. They get taught by other other families that have homeschooling. Those kids do fine. But let's let's just play with this issue that socialization affects kids. Let's just play with it for a minute. If you look back last year, the classroom that you had, there were kids when they come in the room, they're touching each other, slapping five, shaking hands. They meet with the teacher. They come up close to the teacher. They interact. Kids are are sharing lunches, they're playing on the playground together, they're talking, they, they, they're, they're interacting. Let's fast forward to what's coming next month. Those kids are not interacting. They're six feet apart. They got a mask on that little kids have to keep a mask on. Imagine a 10 year old keeping a mask on for eight hours. It ain't gonna happen. Get out of here. I mean, it's common sense that we're talking about. Kids will not stop touching each other. And, 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 and the, the effects that no one is really talking about, but it's, it's, it's a real threat to us, is that the bathrooms, because we can excrete this virus, the bathrooms, the public bathrooms in our schools and our churches represent an area where people are going to get highly, could get infected. Mm. Finally, kids going to be asymptomatic many of them, and they're going to carry it back home. Hmm. So I, I want you to kind of understand the, 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 the environment you're talking about socializing them in. It's not social. They're not going to be social. They're going to be struggling to be social <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where they're wearing a mask. No one can see their face. They're going to be taking that mask off and on all day long. 
They, they got to be sick. They can't touch. They can't come in and touch each other. They're six feet apart. I mean, they can't touch their teacher. They, I mean, what, what are we talking about? No lunchrooms. In fact, the CDC recommends no, uh, no playground play that where they're touching, no field trips where they're going on for learning, uh, no lunch, common lunch areas. I mean, we're not going back to what we had now. So why are we rushing? The final thing I want to say, Dr. Company, I got to tell you this, because I got to tell the people that's listening to this audience, to, to this, this show, that we don't know anything about what's going to ha happen to the long-term consequences of a COVID-19 infection. Mm. So even though you were asymptomatic and you didn't see an outward expression of the virus, you didn't get a headache, you didn't get fever, you didn't get the, the lethargy, or you didn't get feel tired, all of the symptoms, we still don't know that you, we still are expecting that even you could get lung fibrosis. Mm. Even you could have a cardio, a, 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 a left ventricular, a left uh, ventricular uh, problem, a cardiac problem from this infection. Even though we didn't see the outward manifestations, the inward infection is still can cause havoc. Now, for those who really get the virus really bad, we're seeing patients who have the lung fibrosis, I mean, excuse me, have the pneumonia, they're having a long road back. They're just not getting better. Some of them dealing with serious lung fibrosis, which sadly is say enough, probably will not reverse. It's permanent damage to the lung. And so we're talking about exposing kids to something that could give them permanent physical deficits for the rest of their life but we don't know what they are yet so why are we rushing back right now why can't we just wait for a few minutes a few months so that we can kind of begin to see what's happening we're learning from china because they were ahead of us they they're telling us that, that 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 people are people are not recovering as fast as we thought they should it's novel and 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna quote something that just we just learned. Kids ten years and up, you can write it down. Hmm. Kids ten years and up have the same rate of infection as adults. Hmm. So all this stuff we talk about, kids can't give it to kids. Hmm. Get that, all this stuff was data that was analyzed back in February and March when the kids were pulled out of school and in their bubble at home. They were in the crucible of protection at home. They weren't a part of the data. So when you go back and retro analyze and look at data, you're looking at data that don't even include the kids. <laughs> but I want to tell you, and, and 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 Dr. Compton, that's why I came on to, that's why I came on this on the show for you today, because I want to tell the truth. There's some data that just came out. And here's the data. And I I, I want to just say I I I fear that there's a sense that people want to believe that kids won't get infected, or they don't get affected in the same way as adults. I I, I fear that people are believing that information with no, with no real numbers to back it up because those kids that they're talking about weren't even in the studies. Mm -hmm. They were home. Mercy. So oh. June the 3rd, something happened. Texas opened up. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what people are talking about reporting. They're not going to report hospital stuff to the CDC anymore. They're not reporting it, have to report it to HHS, and they're, they, they're holding the numbers down, and they're not testing people. And this, The number came out because the daycare centers had to open. 
And now we get to see what happened. Y'all want to know what happened? Yes. Yeah. Y'all want to see the numbers? Tell us. Let's talk the numbers. Texas and I and I and I, I apologize to my Texas, my Texas friends, because no one wants to be the guinea pig and no one wants to be the first in line to to things that may cause demise. But Texas reported 67 coronavirus cases on May 21. Got it? 67 cases on May 21 in licensed daycare facilities. So we're talking about daycares. They were reported only 67 cases. On June the 3rd, the governor opened them up for the third phase. That means complete open. 12 days later, June 15th, 210 reported cases in 177 facilities, 141 staff members, 69 children. Three weeks later, that was uh, June 9th, so that was, uh, that was around 14 days ago. Someone is asking, Doc, about your sources. Can you mention our share? Yeah, we can, I can, I can send you the sources that you can go to, uh, you know, the, I have the sources here. I, we're, we're doing a Zoom, so it's kind of hard to, mm -hmm. to show the sources, but we, we can give you the sources. Okay. As a matter of fact, you go on the Texas website, and that's where I got them. Mm -hmm. okay. June 15th, we had 210 cases. June 9th, they reported 1,799 infections in the July, daycares. June or July? Excuse me, July 9th. July 9th, that was 14 days ago. How many? 1,799. 1,207 staff members, 592 children, hmm. representing 1,131 child care operations. I got this from their site because it's going to tell the truth now because they open and they reporting. Hmm. That's a 759% increase since June 15th. Mercy. Mercy. Don't tell me kids don't get this virus because it was novel. We don't know. Yeah. And we're basing it on data that has no relevance because those kids weren't included. Hmm. Kids can be carriers. Kids can get extremely sick. Kids pass the virus to other kids. Kids pass the virus to their adult teachers. Kids are pass the virus and take it home. So kids are vectors. Kids are vectors. And, and, and early on, you had the, the a pediatric association saying kids weren't vectors. And now we find it, that ain't true. You were, you were saying the same thing about Oakwood University, right? That maybe they shouldn't open? Well, let me just say this. Spelman, Morehouse undergrad, Clark Atlanta are our leaders. They closing the schools and they haven't in, they're having virtual school. And the reason is because the dormitories are going to be a petri dish for this virus. How are you going to have college kids not touching each other, walking, walking hand in hand across the campus? How are you going to have them wearing masks all day when they come into their room with their roommate? How are you going to keep those two people from infecting each other that went in different places? Where are they going to get food from? The calves can't open and be open to people sitting in the calves and having sit-down dinner. How are they going to eat? I mean, it, 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 it just, it's unbelievable that we're even thinking about opening, let alone opening. Let alone opening. And, and I, 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 commend, I commend Spellman and Clark Atlanta and I commend uh, 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 
Morehouse undergrad for being leaders, for saying, no, you know what? Black and brown people got a five times more chance of being hospitalized and dying from this virus than others. We recognize that. I, I commend them for saying, you know what? We're not putting our kids in the path of this virus and we don't know what the long-term consequences and we don't know how this virus will impact their bodies down the road. We're not putting our kids in front of that, but there's some who do. And so, and so one of our online, um, one of our online participants, Doc, says as a question in line with what you were talking about, is it African Americans who are more susceptible or are we seeing the same thing in Africa and other black communities? Can you speak to that? Well, right now we only have data on African Americans because it's a novel virus. I don't have data from Africa. And African Americans, Latinos, and Italians have this polymorphism that places them at risk of not being able to control this virus, at least alert their bodies that they have the virus in a way that others can't. Hmm. And we believe that's a strong link towards understanding why we have a health disparity, that we get this virus, when we get it, we get worse disease, we get death five times. Can you, can you elaborate on that some more, those disparities yeah. related to- So with, any, with, with, many health, with many diseases, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, different diseases, African Americans have a health disparity that we get it more, prostate cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, we did a study, we took 10 Caucasian men and 10 African American men, we took out their tumors, they were military men. They, had, they were military men. So they were getting the same food, same exercise, the same regimen, they working out, getting the same physical workout to get to stay in the, the to pass the test, so we, it's kind of controlled. The African-American men, their tumors were more aggressive. They were at a Gleason score much higher upon discovery of the cancers than their, than, than their Caucasian counterparts. And, and it just points to, and then when we analyze the tumors, we find proteins that are upregulated in the African-American tumors that are not in the Caucasian tumors which seems to suggest that, that we have a physiological reason why we have a higher reason, not just because we don't take care of ourselves or we don't go to the doctor or we're afraid to go to the doctor. No, it's because that we have a certain physiological issue that places us at having a health disparity. That means you're more susceptible. Knowing that kids of black and brown Americans are more susceptible to this virus, and you still want to put your own people in front of it? Hmm. I'm having a hard time with it. it. For parents who are considering what you have to do this fall, listen, we understand you have to work. And there may be solutions that you can take that will not place your kids in front of this virus. No solutions could be form a bubble or a, or a group of five or six families, four or five families, doesn't matter, that have the same, uh, the, the same outlook on protecting themselves from this virus. They're social distancing, they're wearing their masks, they're not letting people into their homes, they're not putting themselves in large crowds. They, they, they have the same beliefs as you on that regard. And you could form a a pod or, or a group of people that could trade off the responsibility so that one family it doesn't have to do all the responsibilities and keep your kids in a safe environment until we figure out what's going on. We're not saying do this for the rest of their educational life. We're saying do it now until we figure out what you're dealing with. We don't know what we're dealing with. And, 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 and I just want to caution that we understand your pain. We know that you have, that it takes a lot of effort, kids at home, and they want, but they're safe. 
I heard a physician say the kids are going to be more safe in the schools than they are at home. Are you kidding me? I mean, the, are you kidding me? That virus will that virus will not take any will not let anyone off the hook if it gets into you and it infects you. Stay w away from it. And 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 we know now that children, although they don't have, at times many of them don't have as many symptoms, and they don't seem to have a, a, a harder time dealing with it, they do die. There are a percentage that do die. Now, I was going to ask you about what Texas, did you have the percentage of the, the deaths there? You told yeah, us I, don't, I don't have it for the kids right now. I just pulled that data last week. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to analyze, you know, map it to deaths of kids. But clearly, kids are being devastated. And it's, the, the, the thing about, that we have to say about this, you don't get any do-overs with this. You open your, your school and kids and teachers begin to get sick. Let me tell you, most schools can't even keep the flu from coming and closing the schools down. And we're not talking about a disease that caused multi-organ, multi-system, Kawasaki-like disease, all these different multi-organ symptom disease in kids now is a new, new disease. We are, it, it, the flu doesn't cause that, but the novel coronavirus does. And we're dealing, we don't get a do-over. You don't get to pull those kids back and say, okay, you've been exposed, but now you're not exposed. No, once they get exposed, they go back home with that disease. They go back home with the virus. And they, we don't know three, four, five months down the road what happens to their bodies. Well, how does this, this virus, will it wreak havoc on the inside? We don't know. Why are we rushing back for that? Yeah. Because, because the government told us to? <laughs> well, we know we kind of have an idea of what's, I mean, let's just be honest. You know, the environment in which we live right now, um, with an election coming up, uh, I'm going to put it out there. <laughs> it is. And, and it is playing into a lot of this. I mean, I think, I think we all know that. So that's the elephant in the room. Let's, let's just get that off the, the table. Because that, that's a part of what's pushing. So I think we as a people, regardless of whether you're black, white, Republican, Democrat, whatever, we just need to think, right? We, we, we need right. to think and we need to reason through this, our reason, especially as the people of God. Um, Alex, did you want to say something? Yeah, like Anne has a question. She saw a recent news conference that was asking people who had the virus and was cured to donate blood to use the plasma of those individuals to fight the virus. Is this possible? Yes. Convalescent plasma can cure people from this virus. What it is is that you have been infected with COVID-19. Your body has developed antibodies to COVID-19 that are in your plasma and they can take your plasma and they can inject it into people who are in the ICU laying face down with a ventilator and it can help them recover. The problem is that we only can get enough plasma for maybe one maximum three patients per hospital. And some hospitals have 150 patients with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Some patients, some hospitals have 100 in the ICU. Yeah, of course. So we can't use this therapy as a therapy for the masses. It's a life-saving therapy. It's a therapy that we use for emergency use in patients that really don't have any hope. You try to pick one or two of them from the hospital and give them the convalescent plasma. It works, but it's not a real way of treating masses of people that we see that are sick. Okay, right. another question from David. Uh, should we be concerned of the potential microchip that has been mentioned with the vaccine? No. 
Okay. I, I'm a... <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I'm going. I'm going to just say it just like that. No. All right. Uh, let me see if I can get another one. I think you've answered a lot of them already. Yeah. Um, so let, let's talk about. I know someone has something there about zinc and vitamin C. Yeah. And maybe we can talk about. You you kind of sorta, but. Just in terms oh, so, of things. So, so Dr. Dr. Compton, here you go. You're going to be my helper today. <laughs> what happens when the virus comes into the, to the cell? What is the thing that it's seeking to do? It turns off what? Sprinkler. The sprinkler system. It turns the sprinkler system. The sprinkler system represents the body's way, the cell's way to fight infection. It's the way we, it fights inflammation. If the sprinkler system is turned off, all of these things, vitamin C, it goes everywhere. It's not targeted towards that cell. It goes everywhere when you take it. There's no rational reason why it goes to the sick cell versus the normal cell. But it, it can't really help that cell because that cell has its mechanisms for fighting back turned off. So it's like driving, it's like driving the cavalry up to the up to the fight and all the fighters in front have no weapons. Hmm. You can't win. And, and so people want to try these home remedies and things not understanding that the, the virus has actually inactivated your ability to fight it. And, and you, you're giving yourself things that, you know, may help some immune cells boost some immune, immune outside immunity but the cellular processes have been turned off. I, that, that's the problem that we have at this moment. Okay. Michael asked a question. Do people with old blood type um, able to fight the virus better than people who have different blood types? Yeah, there was some data that's been pushed around. I, I haven't seen the real science behind the reports. Um, I, I just saw, uh, you know, someone had put out a report, but we, we got to look at that with the peer-reviewed uh, uh, peer reviewed study section to understand if, if that actually is statistically true. And I, I don't have any, any outcomes on that right now. Um, but we are aware of it. Um, I wouldn't use that as a strategy to go out here and not wear a mask. Okay. How, how long does the antibodies last in a person who has had the virus and go through? Yeah, gotten you, through. You, you can get, you know, so this is the problem. Here, here's the problem. Many people, and I would say most people who get infected with this virus, because it's a novel virus, we're finding that they're not getting the antibody response that is high enough, their titers are high enough that they actually are protected. So that actually says you could be infected again. But mm. second, if you do get the antibodies and you can get the test. So if you think you've had COVID-19, go get the antibody test. There's one that shows for active disease. That's one test. But then there's another test to test your viral antibodies to see if you could be a person that could donate the plasma so they can make convalescent plasma. But nonetheless, for typical immu uh, immunity, I mean, you, you probably have that years. You know, for some, for some things, you get it for a lifetime. Uh, but definitely years. And, and if you have high enough titers, you will be protected from that one virus. Now, let me, let me give you some information. China told us three months ago that they found 30 flavors of this COVID-19. 30. You okay, said 30. I'm giving, I'm giving y'all the information, Doc. I'm, not, I'm just giving the information. We need it. China, we huh? <laughs> Dude, I'm just giving it. China said we got 30 viruses that are cousins to COVID-19. Not all of them are nasty. Some of them are not as bad. But there are a couple that may be very, very virulent. Well, 
Dr. Fauci announced about two weeks ago they had identified one of those variants in the United States that was highly infective and was more infective in children than in adults. So you might have gotten immunity to the first one that came either from Washington, from China to Washington State, or the other virus that came from China to Europe to New York. You may have gotten one of those variants, but if there's another variant that comes out, you may not have any immunity to that one. And that's why, that's why the drugs, again, is, is, and any vaccine could be problematic. Any vaccine may provide you one season of use. And if we get another one, another type of COVID-19, we're going to have a, we, you, you're not going to be, it's just like the flu. You know, it's hit or miss with 50% mm -hmm. chance that you get the right, the right uh, antibody, develop the right antibodies for the, the flu that's, that's, that's there. And the, the question, this is the question that we have, that people who get the antibodies, they get the infection, they get the antibodies. If they get enough high enough antibodies, they're protected against that one. We don't know that you're protected against other ones. And that's the problem. Now, 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 now Doc, listen to me on this one. In, in, no, in October, November, we got something that's called G4. It's coming. It's a swine flu that we, they found in pig farmers that jumped just like the coronavirus. It jumped from the animal, and they found that over 10% of the workers now have this virus in their bloodstream. That virus is coming. So we got COVID-19, we got the G4, and we're going to have the flu. We're going to have a trifecta of three viruses, which we're not going to know which one you have Mercy. until we test you. And so people talking about throwing kids into this environment. We, we can't, we, 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 we can't with a good conscience. We can't, with a good conscience, put kids so in the path of what's coming. Pastor Darrell, I think your mic is on, but we're not hearing you clearly. Uh, okay. Well, Pastor right. Darrell, I can, I can, I can talk with you later uh, to talk to you about your so, questions. So of people asking. Yeah, uh, I do. Come through. Yeah. How about now? Yeah, now we can hear you. You're good now. Yeah, awesome. So we have a couple people asking, uh, are the supplements okay for those who have not yet contracted the virus? In other words, is it okay uh, to take those supplements to try to ward it off? Um, you're not going to ward off the infection of the, of the COVID-19 with supplements. You're going to take supplements to have better uh, well healthiness. The supplements are very good for making you feel better, making you feel more energetic, you should take them. But this COVID-19 doesn't work. It doesn't, that, that's not putting up an army in front of this COVID-19 or a barrier in front of this COVID-19. It comes in with the spike protein and it just jams it into the cell. No, no, no vitamin C is gonna stop that. No, no supplements are gonna stop that. You're gonna get infection. And, but the question is, you know, if you can have a high enough immune system that, that, that it just stays as an infection that you get seven to 10 days or 14 days of, of just feeling like the, you know, the crust and it goes away. Most people get that scenario, but a significant number don't. And that's the problem is that who gets it and who doesn't get it. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, closing your eyes and picking the person. We don't know. And so, yes, supplements are good for health. We should take supplements when you are deficient in something, but they will not have a anything if you sniff or ingest the COVID-19 virus. All right, so we got another question coming in here. 
Um, if you can say something about long haulers or long-term COVID patients, does do you have any data that can give insight into their recovery and prognosis? And I think one of the things that comes behind this is um, why does it take people with se severe symptoms so long to recover and why do their symptoms keep reoccurring? Yeah, we don't know, but we do know that, that these patients su uh, suffer severe complications that can take months. We don't even know if it's years or lifetime to recover mm -hmm. because we, this is the, the word novel. Mm -hmm. We have no data to actually tell you anything about what's going to happen in the future because it's novel. But we've dropped the word novel. We just say COVID-19, coronavirus. We don't, never, we don't say novel. But these patients who have a high viral load or have experienced severe symptoms, uh, catastrophic symptoms, many of them had to go to the hospital. Some of them progressed to the ICU. Now, let me give you some stats on that. From one of my hospital executive friends, and I won't name the hospital which for, for reasons that is, is, I, I don't want to do that, but he gave me some 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 information. If you get the infection and you go to the hospital, in their hospital, if you just, so let's say you come in the emergency room and you have uh, fever, feeling, feeling weak, um, some cough, they're going to give you a chest x-ray. They see a cloudy chest x-ray with infiltrates that you've got pneumonia. They they take you and admit you to the hospital. You got a 20% chance of dying in that hospital from just being admitted. If you progress and you have to be put into the ICU at their hospital, he says that you have about a 60% chance of dying. <laughs> you don't want this virus because we don't know how if you are, if you're the one that progresses, we don't have anything to stop it, except for convalescent plasma, which, I mean, it's like winning the lottery if you get a convalescent plasma injection. Okay, can Florina ask, can you elaborate a little more on drug therapy and how uh, he expects the vaccine will work on the body? Okay, let me give you a little thing about drug therapy. That's different from vaccines. Drug therapies are meant to either, the ones we have now can be divided into, they kill the virus, that's antivirus, that's a resdem resdemosvir, which is used for emergency use um, to kill the virus. So they're antiviral, they kill the viral, virus. Uh, they can work by stopping replication they can work by being directly toxic to the virus itself, or they can work by, uh, by, by, by attacking the virus in some way. That's a drug therapy. You can also have a drug therapy that would boost the host immunity to the virus. That means turn your own immunity back on, turn your own sprinkler system back on so that you can fight this virus. That's a drug therapy. And we can list all of the, and I've written a, you know, a nice paper, a nice review on these, on these different uh, therapies. But we can, we can, uh, you, you can, you can kind of uh, lump all of the different tri trials. We probably have, you know, it's more than a hundred different drugs that are being tested now. Probably way more than that. I know there's a more than a hundred vaccines being tested, but the drug therapies, these would be used to do one or two things, kill the virus or boost the host immunity to be able to attack the, the virus. And then there's a third one, boost the host immunity so that you can overcome or, or quench the, uh, the reactive oxygen or the cytokine storm that results from, from, from the release of these, these uh, these cytokines that cause this, this problem. So really it's just three, it's three, uh, 
I would say three categories that drugs can be in. Now, viruses, uh, vaccines are different. That's a different thing. And, and the vaccine, I guess you could list them as under, also under therapies that would attack the virus and because they attack the virus and they, they either attack it at a specific place. Most people are aiming the vaccine at the spike protein. The one that's in, uh, that's furthest ahead is in, is in Britain and they have uh, targeted it to the spike protein. Our, the virus, uh, the vaccine here is a mRNA virus. I mean, excuse me, the mRNA vaccine and it's targeted towards the, the, the spike protein as well. So um, those are the strategies that we're using and uh, even convalescent plasma, which is comes from someone else, attacks the pro attacks the virus. It's a it attacks the virus. So it's either you attack the virus, or you boost the immune system of the host. Those are the, really the two uh, strategies that we're using, and they include vaccines as well. All right. So Robbie is asking. So what are parents to do if their child's school opens? Um, let's take a, let's take a step back, Doc. Let's take a step back. They walk you to the edge of a cliff. They say you can walk down this path and walk back to the car or you can jump off the cliff. Parents are walking to the cliff of the schools have decided they're going to open. They don't care. Just like they said, they're going to open up the, 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 the economy by saying, we don't care. Y'all get infected. Just get infected. It doesn't matter. We're going to open up stores and everything and whatever. Schools are saying the same thing because it's the same group of people making the decisions. So the schools say, okay, we don't care. Some of us need, some of our schools need the money. We're private. Some of us are public and we don't really care. You just, we're going to open. Our teachers and students are walking up to the cliff and you got to make a decision. You're going to jump or you're going to go back to the car. Right now, I'm telling you that the, the jumping part, going back to school, it's highly risky because kids are going to get infected. We can't even control flu, let alone control this. They're going to get infected. They're going to bring it back to you. And it's going to be continue. And I, I'll tell you this. Watch this. Everyone, whether they agree with this or not, that agree with school openings, will say, when schools open, kids are going to get infected. Communities will see a cluster of infection take root, and it will include all children of all ages. Everyone saying that. The people who are deciding to open the schools and the people who are, just, who are, who are sounding the alarm, they say, please don't put yourself in this predicament. If all kids are going to get infected, why won't your kids get infected? And are you willing to take the risk that if they get infected, they'll either get better or they won't get better? I, I don't see the, I, I mean, when you think about it clear and you think about it in those terms, I don't see what the decision is about. We're not saying keep kids out of school forever. We're not saying keep kids out of school for a number of years. My sons are going to college. They're going to take it online from home. They're not going to, I'm not sending my kids into a death trap that I know they're going to get infected. I walked up to the cliff. I looked over and I walked to the car. You have to make the decision 
of what you're going to place your kids in front of this virus or not. They will get infected. That's a good question. Well, one question was, what should people do that are scared? Sound like oh. you can't answer that. All right. That's a good question. That's a very good question. But I'm giving us some very grim information here, Doc. No, no, no. Cool. I'm giving the information so we don't run and just jump off the cliff. Right. I want us not to jump off the cliff. I it's want safe. us to go back to and get in the car and go home. Yes. That, that's the information. I'm scared. But God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. That's right. That's right. And, and so by knowing that there's a, let me say this. I had a pit bull that was biting everybody, bit the postman, bit my neighbor, bit the kid on the bicycle. And my friend that would come over, they would see my pit and they wouldn't get out the car. Because <laughs> they know if you go in the yard, what's going to happen? He's going to bite you. He going to bite you. COVID-19 is in the yard. It's a pit bull in the yard. It has bitten. It's killed 140,000 United States citizens. It's, it's killed black people and brown people at a disproportional rate than others. The dog is in the yard. <laughs> I, I can't break it down no clearer than that. Yeah. We got to wait until we have one of the three things I outlined, we have to wait until we understand what the consequences of infection causes. We have to wait because we don't really know. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put my I'm gonna put myself out there. We don't really know how this virus causes the down the later effects of what this virus does to your body. We don't know it in adults, and we definitely don't know it in children because they're they going to get the first real taste of this because you know what? Our kids haven't gotten a real taste of this yet. They're going to get a real taste when you send them back to school. I don't want my kids to have a taste of that. That's one thing they can stay can, they, somebody else can have that. Mercy, mercy. Well, for those the question, you... I want to say something about the fear. We fear things that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that's why this, 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 this uh, show is so important, provided by the Decatur Church and the Longview Heights Church for their communities, because they love you, because they want you to understand what's happening. They want you to have the truth. The truth is, we got to decide about how we're going to deal with this virus from a protected posture, not from a vulnerable posture mm. where it's actively infecting us. I I'm begging you, just, just let it sink in for a minute. I don't want to be involved with this virus. I got to stay back for a little more time until we understand how to fight it and we understand how it works. Social distancing is working to keep you safe. It keeps you safe. But if you put yourself in a vulnerable position, this thing is going to bite you. I look at the summer camps. There was a summer camp that came on. I don't care what they did at the summer camp. Tried social distancing. 82, people, 82 kids got infected in the first week. Because we don't know how this virus works. But they're going to get exposure. And, and the, people, the people who are in charge in our government just said, we don't care how it works. We're we sending your kids back. They're not sending my kids back. And I hope for some of you that listen to this program this evening that you make a decision to protect your kids too. Thank you. It's, that's so important, and that's why exactly uh, we wanted to share this with people. Um, we want to help you. Um, it's such a risk that you're taking, and uh, I wanted them, them to hear it from somebody that, that 
studies this and understands it. Uh, another question was asked, um, what about obese people? Um, are they more likely to uh, succumb to this? There's data that seems to suggest any, if you have a comorbidity, and I think it's all related to one thing, whether it's obesity, whether it's heart disease, whether it's diabetes, they all affect your ability to respond, immune response. All of those diseases affects your immune system in some way. And so the commonality is that you, you have, uh, you have a, a chance to get this virus more in a higher proportion than others who don't have these comorbidities. Uh, so, so Pastor Horton, I would tell that person that, uh, that you, yes, they have, they, have, um, they have increased likelihood of potentially getting it, but not just getting the virus. The, it's the outcome that we more worry about. And, and those people with comorbidities uh, need to avoid this virus. And, and that includes age as well. You know, when we first saw this virus, and you can, you can testify to this, they told us, oh, it is only affects the older people. It's 65 was the age. <laughs> you know, now the age last month was 37. Wow. And guess what? When they expose kids to this virus, guess what that age, average age is going to be? Wow. Yeah. Because yeah. they weren't included in the database. Okay. And so they haven't seen it yet. A doctor uh -huh. in Texas stated if you take certain inhalers in combination with other med medical, you should be completely healed. Is that true? That was just a question. <laughs> Can you ask the question again, Pastor Horton? Come on, again. Can you ask that question again? I'm just, I'm just the post. I'm going to keep my, I'm going to keep my, I'm going to keep my face straight as okay. you ask it. Could you ask that again okay. so everybody can hear it? A doctor in Texas, he stated if you take certain inhaler, inhaler in combination with other medical you, medication. medication, you should be completely healed from the, virus. from the virus. Is that true? No. no. <laughs> and that's a doctor saying that. And I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be more, pointed. Once you get this infection, we're working on therapies and, and there's some good clinical trials that are coming. There's a couple of there's a couple of drugs that are coming out, dexamethasone they've seen that have some effect. Um, and maybe that's the inhaler that he's talking about. Uh, but uh, let, let, let me say this. We haven't done enough work to know what is actually statistically effective in helping overcome this virus. It's too soon. We've only seen this virus about six, seven months. Not, not even, not even a, a full year yet. We don't know yet. There, there's, some, there's some evidence that there's some medicines like uh, the statins, and the ARBs for hypertension. If you're on these drugs, there's some strong data coming out of China and coming out of Italy and even here in the U US in clinical trials for those drugs that show that they turn the sprinkler system back on and they protect people from this virus. Once you get it, they don't, they don't protect you from getting the virus. And I want everybody to be clear doesn't protect you from getting the virus. It protects you. Once you get it, you don't get the multi-organ disease that goes with it. It's just like a you have like a common cold for eight to 10 days. I think we got, I think he's froze. Yeah. Are you, you froze uh, Compton? No, I'm good, I'm good. I think he's, he's frozen. yeah, he's just frozen on his screen. Uh, I had just two more questions. Okay. 
let's see if we can uh, give him a minute and see if we can get him back. Um, let me reach out to him. Yeah, we're coming down to the end. Yeah, yeah we went over five. Uh, did you tell an hour and a half? Yeah, we said an hour and a half. Let's, uh, so we, we, we're wrapping. Let me see if I can reach him. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's, he's going to try to come back in. Okay. This is good. Yeah, man, this is awesome. So we, we are recording this, Daryl, Pastor Daryl said. Yes. So in order to get it again, how would somebody uh, get it? They'd go on Facebook, or how would they get it again? Yeah, Pastor, Pastor Daryl, would you tell, share with everyone if you can unmute yourself and share how can we retrieve this? And that's, this is a good break while uh, Milton's getting ready to come back on. Yeah, you are muted. You're good. Everybody, yes, we are recording via Zoom. And so uh, in about 24 hours, the recording will be available uh, via Facebook and or YouTube. Uh, that's at the Decatur SDA Church. We'll also share a copy with the Longview Church uh, so that they can add it to their social media channels if they desire as well. Thank you so much, Pastor. Awesome, awesome. So again, to those of you listening, uh, it will be available. Check out the Longview Heights uh, website or the Decatur SDA Church website, and we will make the full recording available to you. So Dr. Uh, Brown had a power or outage. Who's that? Dr. Brown. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's what he said. Um, oh, is that what he said? Yeah. Someone, someone said... Margo said, Dr. Brown, Dr. Brown had a power outage, his wife told me. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you all, we, we have pretty much, um, we have covered, uh, I'd say, 98% or 99% of the questions. And uh, all the questions that we had, he has more than answered them. And as Pastor Horton shared with you all, it was simply our desire to really just help the people of God to provide information that's relevant, that's accurate, that's timely uh, from somebody who knows it firsthand. And that's what Dr. Milton Brown does. Uh, he's a scientist, he's a researcher, this is his field. And so we're really and truly deeply appreciative um, of the fact that he came and spent this time with us and that you joined us. We truly appreciate, uh, appreciate that as well. I wish he was here and we'll certainly let him know that so many of you have indicated how blessed you are with it. And we pray that you will share this information with others, that you will let them know that they can go to the Longview Heights Church in Memphis, Tennessee. You can Google that. Pastor Hart, why don't you tell us uh, your, your, uh, your handles if you want to share that. It's real simple. Uh, for, to get to, to, to us, you just go like you just said, Longview Heights SDA Church. Um, that, that, will, that will bring you right to our website and um, you can get right on. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And uh, for the Decatur uh, Church family, it's www.decatursdachurch.org. That's our website. And you can go there. Pastor Darrell, do you want to add anything else as far as YouTube or Facebook handles? Or yeah, yeah. You know? Prefer preferably okay, you're breaking up. Pastor, you're breaking up. Yeah, uh, Facebook or YouTube, Decatur SDA, uh, or on Facebook or YouTube. Facebook or YouTube, Decatur The government SDA. won't let us be great. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook or YouTube, at Decatur. Hey, Doc. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, that's what's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, one of the seven days in the church for Facebook. And, um, and she shared that, so. Yeah, we, so. Yeah, we're just in 24 up. hours, we'll get all that information for our church as well. Put it on our Facebook as well, yeah, our YouTube, our YouTube um, so the people can all, all get that from there. I think this was something that is a blessing to so many people. Uh, it's a hard decision for parents, but... Um, you want to say uh, do you want to jump off the cliff or do you want to get back in the car? That was pretty good. All the different things that he said. So I think that's something really helpful. Awesome. Awesome. And I do have, so, so for those listening, Dr. Brown 
had a power outage. I tell you, this thing was so heavy, it was so important, the yeah. devil got mad. But, yeah. but I got him on my phone here, and he just wants to say a few closing words to us, and I'm going to let him say that. Go ahead, Doc. Thank you. I just want to say to the listener audience that in, in Memphis, surrounding areas, in, in Atlanta, Decatur, Georgia, listen, God is going to be with us. He's going to get us through this, this problem. We have to stay away from it because it's attacking even the people of God. 200 Adventists in New York, dead. Right. In different parts of the country, dead. Bishops, pastors from around the country did not survive. It tells us that we have to be careful with the virus. We have to be, we have to be smart. And, 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 and it'll be a time when we can come out and, and, and rejoin uh, our communities. But right now, let's be safe. Let's keep our kids safe. Let's be safe. Let's wear our mask. Let's social distance. Let's wash our hands. That's all we have. Let's stay away from the public bathrooms. That's all we have at the moment to protect us from this virus until until it's the time to, to until we have a time for therapy or vaccine. God bless you, and I hope that that uh, you, know, you will continue to be safe and that you will make decisions for your kids about the schools in the fall. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. We greatly appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us and to share this excellent information with us. And as a matter of fact, this was so good. And, and I want to let you know, a lot of people in the chat section here have expressed their appreciation to you yes. about this information, that it was so timely and relevant. So again, we thank you. And we probably want to have you back for a part two. We hope that we, we have a vaccine or a drug or something at that time. You know, we'll be speaking a little differently. You gotta have me back before that, because we're not expecting that till next year. So if you have me back before that, that would be great. <laughs> oh, awesome. We'll we'll plan for it. We'll plan All for right. it. All right. Awesome. Well, right. Pastor Alex, would you, Pastor Horn, would you give us a closing prayer to close? Sure. Us? Let's, let's pray together. Our Father, we told in heaven, we realize that you are God. You are sovereign. You are the Creator. And although the devil has caused a malfunction in your creation because of sin, you still are the victor. In fact, you said that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So today, Lord, keep your people safe. Help us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Help us not to fear, knowing that God is on our side. Keep us so close to you, O oh Lord, that regardless of what comes our way, that we will trust in the Lord. Thank you again for your promises that you will never leave us nor forsake us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, everyone. Have a good one. Take care. Hey, God All bless you, right. man. We'll try to do it again. All right. We'll be in touch. All right. Okay. All right. See you later.